Welcome back, life science learners, to the next segment. We've just looked at an overview of the male and female reproductive systems. Let's continue with our revision lesson on the male and female reproductive systems. In this segment, we're going to try a few more questions and try and hone in on the application of our understanding of both the male and female reproductive systems. So let's get straight into the lesson. I've got a few questions that we can work through, and I trust that while we do this, that you think about these answers and you're able to respond in your heads or write down so that when we discuss these, that you kind of had an opportunity to test yourself while this happens. So, again, here's a question that we're going to look at. The question reads, indicate whether each of these statements in column 1 applies to A only, B only, both A and B, or none of the items in column 2. Write A only, B only, both A and B or none next to the question number. So guys, these questions often come up in the first section of your exam paper, and they, they often are easy questions, but can be very confusing. Because as I mentioned, each of these questions have four possible options. So you ha have to write either A only, B, A, B, or none of them. So this means that it does become a bit more confusing that you've got to consider four options for each answer. And so this will test a thorough understanding of concepts or terminology. And hence, you've got to spend some time reading through these carefully to ensure that you're not giving uh, an answer that is wrong because you've rushed through it or you've misinterpreted the question. So let's read with a highlighter if you have one and highlight the key concepts in the question so that it makes it easier for us to be able to establish what the answer is. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next slide, and I've enlarged that for you. So column one, the first question. The tube leading from the testes to the urethra in males. So guys, if we go back and reflect on the male reproductive system, the tube that leads from the testes to the urethra would be the tube that carries out from the epidermis, epididymis, sorry, all the way up to the ejaculatory duct, and that's the vas deferens or the sperm duct. Okay, so let's look at the options that are given in column two. So vas deferens, correct, as I mentioned, and the second option B is the seminiferous tubules. So guys, if we recollect where the seminiferous tubules are, these are tubules that you find within the testes, and it is in these tubules that the process of spermatogenesis occurs, or the division and production of the sperm cells. So it's certainly not B, but it's definitely A, so the answer here is A only. And so remember that we've got to illustrate exactly the way the question requires us to respond. So it's A only. Well done if you've got that. The next term in column two, in column one, sorry, is the birth canal. Now guys, the birth canal refers to the, process, the passage through which the baby passes during a normal natural vaginal delivery. So let's look at that concept. So we've got two options here, and we know that the birth canal is from the uterus into the vagina. And so let's look at what options are given. In column two, we have the uterus so, and the urethra. Certainly not the urethra. However, if you're thinking about the uterus, remember that the question says birth canal. And so the uterus is the structure in which the baby develops during gestation. So it's certainly not the uterus. And hence, in this, none of these are correct. And so we've got to il illustrate clearly that none of these options are correct. The next question is, tube that releases semen from the male. So again, it's the tube that releases the semen from the male. So guys, the options that are given here are the ureter and the urethra. Now, if you go back to recollecting what the ureters were, and these are the structures that carry urine from the kidney all the way to the bladder. So, so that's the urethra or the ureters, and these are not correct. However, the tube that carries the semen out of the body along with urine is called the urethra. So the answer here is B only. Okay. The next question, number four. Hormone that stimulates, so it's a hormone that stimulates the development of secondary sexual characteristics in males. And we were chatting about this earlier on, and we said that puberty is influenced by 
the hormone testosterone in males. So if we look at it, FSH, that stimulates the development of the sperm cells. So it's not linked with uh, actually the development of secondary sexual characteristics, but it is the hormone testosterone that is linked to the development of male characteristics at puberty. And so the answer here would be B only. Okay, well done if you got that. Let's look at the fifth part. The part of the female reproductive system where fertilization takes place. So guys, the process of fertilization happens in the fallopian tube. So as the, after ovulation, when the egg enters into the fallopian tube, you'll find that a sperm that may have entered the body will fertilize with that egg in the fallopian tube. So it's the fallopian tube in which this process occurs. So the cervix is the opening between the vagina and the uterus, and so it's certainly not that, but it's definitely the fallopian tube, and we have the option B only come up again. So well done if you were able to get these. As I said, it does take a little while, and it's important that you read these options carefully and understand that you're making the correct decision and not a rushed decision. Okay, let's continue with a few more questions on the male and female reproductive system. The diagram below represents a cross-sectional view. So this is a cross-sectional view of the human seminiferous tubule in which spermatogenesis is occurring. Study the diagram and answer the questions that follow. So guys, just to give you context, again, we referring to the seminiferous tubules. If I help you recollect the seminiferous tubules, if we take a section through the testes, we've got these lobes, and in these lobes, we've got several coil tubes. And so these coil tubes are the tubes in which spermatogenesis occurs. So these tubes, cubes, sorry, these tubes, sorry, have been cut into a cross section. So we're taking one of these tubes and we're looking at it in a cross section. So that's essentially what we're looking at in this diagram. So we're looking at a cross section through the seminiferous tubules showing the process of spermatogenesis. And essentially this process shows you the development from these germinal epithelial cells, which are right here on the lining of the seminiferous tubules, to the process of them developing to becoming young um, spermatids to fully developed sperm cells there. So this is again, as I mentioned, this is all happening within the seminiferous tubules. Let's look at the questions based on this. Again, yeah, a larger view of that. And if I were to complete this, that, that is what the seminiferous tubule would look like. And there's an adjacent seminiferous tubule there. And so this process that is occurring here is the production of your sperm cells, which are, we see right here at the bottom from your germinal epithelial lining of the seminiferous tubules. Let's look at question one. Name the hormone produced by the cells of Leydig. Now, if we go to the diagram and if we look at the Leydig cells, a little earlier on we looked at hormones responsible for the development of secondary sexual characteristics as well as the production of sperm cells. So it would be these cells called the Leydig cells. In some books it's referred to as the interstitial cells. Interstitial meaning cells between the seminiferous tubules. So in this diagram, the hormone produced by these Leydig cells is testosterone. And so the testosterone is produced by these cells that then enter into the seminiferous tubules, stimulating the process of spermatogenesis or sperm formation. Okay, so that is testosterone. Question two, name one function of the hormone mentioned in question one. So what are the functions of testosterone? We know that testosterone is important in maintaining male characteristics. It also stimulates the development of sperm. At puberty, testosterone is responsible for the development of secondary sexual characteristics. And so you can mention three possible functions of testosterone. So that's important for you to understand is that testosterone has several functions in terms of muscle development, growth of pubic hair, body hair, the deepening of the voice. So those are all associated with the development of secondary sexual characteristics. So try not to give two functions that are similar, so in the sense that the secondary sexual characteristics, but give one that relates to puberty, and the other in terms of the general function of testosterone being linked to sperm formation. Right, 
So more questions on this. How many chromosomes are in each of the following? So guys, this takes us back to the process of spermatogenesis as well as linking that to meiosis. So if we look at the spermatogonium cell, and that's illustrated here, we know that in, during the process of spermatogenesis, a single cell divides, undergoes series of divisions to form four cells. And these four cells are your spermatids or your sperm cells. So if we were to look at the number of chromosomes in these cells, and if you look quite carefully into these diagrams, it shows you the processes of meiosis occurring. So these cells are generally your diploid cells, which undergo first matic division to give you two haploid cells, which in turn divide to produce four cells that are each haploid. And so if we look at a human cell, a human diploid cell should have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. So that cell would have 23 pairs. And the next cell, the spermatid here, if you look at them, these that are produced at the end would be these cells here. So they would be haploid cells. And in the context of a human haploid cell, that would have 23 single chromosomes and not pairs. So these would be 23 chromosomes. Okay. So it's important that you link your understanding of meiosis to these questions, especially with regards to the number of chromosomes that occur in these cells at different stages of development. Explain the importance of spermatogenesis as a mechanism to introduce variation by referring to prophase 1 and metaphase 1. So guys, in this question here, you've got to refer to meiosis. And if you recollect in meiosis, there's a lot of variation that is brought about. And that variation happens, as we pointed out, in prophase 1. And so the key concept to, of prophase 1 is that crossing over occurs. And we saw that the homologous pairs lie next to each other with the inner chromatids exchanging genetic information. And that process is referred to as crossing over. And that produces variation in the resulting gametes at the end of meiosis 2. So in prophase 1, we know that crossing over occurs, and that is the variation that we see in the gametes. In metaphase 1, guys, if we recollect at metaphase 1, we know that there is this imaginary equator, and along the equator we find the homologous pairs of chromosomes meeting, and they meet in a very independent fashion. So we talk about the, the arrangement of chromosomes along the equator being independent, and so we refer to that as independent assortment. And so these chromosomes arrange themselves independently. And that allows for significant variation when they move apart during anaphase 1. And it's important that you understand this as a significant process in producing variation. So as we wrap this segment up, we mentioned that it's in prophase 1, and we refer to the process of crossing over, which produces the variation in the chromatids and we see that variation present in the gametes. As I mentioned, in metaphase 1, the homologous pairs will meet along the equator, and these are randomly arranged. And so that process of random assortment occurs when chromosomes are going to be moved apart during anaphase 1. So guys, collectively, we've got to be able to link processes like meiosis to spermatogenesis and oogenesis. So guys, that's a wrap for this question. Let's see if we can get on to more revision in the next bit.